Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here. This is very, very exciting. Um, my name is Megan Harbaugh. I'm a graduate student at the University of Montana studying political science and it's my honor to kick everything off tonight. We're thrilled to see such an awesome turnout for this presentation. It just goes to show that this is a very important and pressing issue that we really care about in Montana. Citizens United has very obviously touched Montanans personally, and this is why we feel, as I'm sure all of you do, that it's important to continue this discussion. I'm also excited to announce that this presenta presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as part of a media access or assistance grant that was donated to us by MCAT. And if anyone is interested in learning more about that, you can visit MCAT.org. And now to introduce our guest speakers tonight and provide us with some background on the topic of Citizens United in Montana, I will turn the floor over to C.B. Pearson with Stand with, with Montanans. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the great turnout. Uh, we're really uh, pleased to have some great speakers tonight. It's going to be a stimulating conversation. Um, you have a program in front of you because we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have a couple of uh, folks give remarks. We're going to have some reaction and then we're going to have questions and answers. And we've got it set up to do a full 90 minutes. So hold on to your pants and uh, shorts or whatever. Um, and uh, for fo folks who don't know, my name is C.B. Pearson. And I am representing Montana Common Cause and also Stand with Montanans. I've been active in campaign finance reform here in Montana since 1983, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, I was the treasurer and one of the principal folks working on I-166 in 2002. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a background and then kind of get us going First of all, I really want to thank our hosts who helped put this all together. American Promise, which we're going to hear more about. Uh, Free Speech for People, Stand with Montanans, Anthony Johnstone, who probably is not here tonight, but he had a lot of great input into this. Uh, Evan Barrett, who's going to be part of our reaction panel. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about each. And then Frank Garner from the, from the Flathead, down from Kalispell, is going to speak for a moment. Uh, we have Representative Christy Clark and then former Secretary of State Bob Brown. And then uh, we uh, really recruited hard to get the former Attorney General and the current Governor Steve Bullock here. Uh, wasn't able to make it, had a family obligation. Uh, we do have a nice letter from him. As you know, he agreed to be a host. He thinks it's a very important topic for Montana. Uh, we also have a very nice letter from Senator Tester. Uh, we are going to read those because of MCAT, so we apologize if you can read it yourself, but we think it's important to get it into the record. Uh, our sponsors, and really want to appreciate the effort, was Common Cause of Montana, Stand with Montanans, Montperg, and then Bryce Bennett gets a special shout out. He really is helpful to put together the event in the back. Uh, he's been really helpful. We have the American Constitution Society Law Student Chapter at the University of Montana. They have some materials, if you guys didn't see it, and they actually, I saw, have copies of Jeff's book, which is great. Uh, I know he did a presentation recently to that organization at their national conference. Is that correct? Thanks. Great. Uh, and then we have Missoula Moves to Amend, and Sue's been very helpful. Thank you, Sue Kirschmeyer. I'm assuming she's in here. Thank you, Sue. Yes, there she is. Thank you. Uh, and then we also have the support of the Montana Trial Lawyers. So I'm going to take a look at your program and then I'm going to introduce everyone really quickly and then we're going to get them up and speaking. Um, first of all, it's going to be Montana State Representative Frank Gardner. Uh, is a Republican member, current member of the Montana House of Representatives from District 7 in Kalispell. He was first elected uh, in 2014, had his first session in 2015 and he's up for re-election. Uh, what people may not know is that he marshaled uh, Senate Bill 289 through the House in a very tough debate, yeah. four hours. <laughs> great, great leadership there. Uh, we have a, a brief statement from the governor. Uh, what folks may not know about uh, the governor as uh, the former attorney general, he represented Mon Montana. Uh, and in our uh, 
around the uh, litigation and, and trying to move forward when we were challenged by American traditional partners as a result of uh, Citizens United. I think we're going to have more about that from some of our speakers. Uh, uh, Governor Bullock has been an exceptional advocate for campaign finance reform and disclosure. Uh, he gives his apologies. Uh, also, a brief statement from our senior senator, John Tester. Um, he's what you probably don't know about him is that he has introduced a constitutional amendment. He signed onto it, which Jeff will talk about, uh, in the U.S. Senate, and he's been a strong advocate for campaign finance reform. Uh, and our featured speakers and why we're here, and um, you can blame some of the evening here, this beautiful evening while we're in the room, on former uh, Montana Justice uh, Jim Nelson. Uh, he was the one who suggested that Jeff come out and speak. Uh, Jeff has been on a tour of the West Coast. Uh, we have some, he's going to report on some of the progress we're making around the constitutional amendment. Uh, and uh, he can bring us up to date. And uh, one of the fun things about Jeff that you may not know is, and I just found this out, he's going to Yellowstone from here. So he's going to have a great vacation here. But, Retired uh, Montana Supreme Court Justice James Nelson, he's on the board of Free Speech for People and a member of the National Advisory Board for American Promise. Um, as a campaign finance reform advocate, now American Promise is basically how do we bring the coalition of people together to get this work done? And Jeff's going to talk more about it. I know in my work in campaign finance reform, every significant change that we've done has been through a bipartisan effort. So we got to get at that. Um, Justice Nelson was appointed to the Montana Supreme Court in 1993 by Governor Mark Roscoe, then elected in 94, 96, and 2004. Uh, he's been retired um, after 19 years on the Supreme Court in 2012. Uh, he's been active with the trial lawyers, receiving their public service award, uh, awards from the Montana S American Civil Liberties. Um, Montana America Civil Liberties Union and the American Bar Association. And Jeff, uh, as I mentioned, just got through his West Coast um, swing. Jeff Clements is the president of American Promise, where he's really working hard, uh, and folks around the country are working hard to bring together folks uh, on both and all sides of the political spectrum. Um, he's really going to present a case for the 28th Amendment and what the path is forward and what we need to do here in Montana to help. Uh, he's the author of Corporations Are Not People, Reclaiming Democracy from Big Money and Global Corporations. Uh, he uh, is well written and speaks often. So we're so glad to have him out and about. Uh, we have him for our reaction panel, and they've been really strong supporters. We have Bob Brown, a Republican who I often would refer to him and been referred to him when he was in the Senate as the Dean of the Senate. We worked together on several pieces of legislation over the years. He's been a friend and an ally. And a, he, uh, when I said, we have this going on, Citizens United, I hate that decision. First thing out of his mouth. So he's going to give a short reaction in five minutes. And then one of my other good friends, Evan Barrett from Butte, he's a, he's a Democrat. So we're fortunate to have the Republicans and Democrats together speaking unitedly. We may not all agree on the exact path, but we think we've got to get something done. Um, Evan is a longtime uh, business development leader, uh, political leader, and educator. Uh, he's from Butte. He drove all the way down. We appreciate that. Uh, he currently teaches at Highlands College in Butte and is also their directors, director of business and community outreach. So. Uh, welcome, all of you, and then we're going to start off with our fine representative. Thank you again for coming. Good evening. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, and my name is Frank Garner. I'm a Republican from Kalispell. I'm the representative from House District 7, and I think if there's Anything I'd like to do over the next hour and a half, that's what I have, right? <laughs> just checking. Um, I, I want to share with you just a couple of things maybe that impacted me that brought me here tonight. Right? Fate's a funny thing. So I think it was Mark Twain that said if they thought uh, it would make a difference, they'd never let us vote. Right? 
And I guess as a, uh, as a police officer, because I'm a career police officer, and the retired police chief from Kalispell, and a father, I, I guess I never really thought or knew who they was, right? Never was on my radar screen. And after I retired from the police department, um, I went to Afghanistan for a year. And uh, I came back home, and I have three kids. I have one who's a lab scientist, one who's a police officer, and one who's in jail. It's OK, he works there. Um, <laughs> and I decided that it was important to me to quit complaining and to try to see if I could do something about some of the things that I had concerns about. Because the worries I have are about my kids not having the same opportunities I have. I've been very blessed. Um, and I've, thank goodness, been given more than I deserve in my life. And so I decided to run for office, first time in my life. And I decided to run for the House District uh, in Kalispell. And I made some commitments. I wanted to make sure the people there who knew me knew I was listening to them and them only. I decided not to take money from people outside of my area and no money from PACs. And so I, I did that, and keep this a secret, just between us, I got elected. Okay. And not that I think all PACs are bad, by the way. You know, I just sent a check back from the dentist. I don't think they're a bad bunch unless you're sitting in their chair, right? But, you know, there, there are good associations out there. I, I think there are reasons for people to get together to have common interests. But it was important to me to make that statement to the people in my community what was odd is that this guy never ran for office, right? And we're citizen legislatures. We go 90 days every two years um, to Helena. And I was getting phone calls, offers, money from people outside of the state. I thought that was kind of odd. But I used to be a detective, so I think I knew why. But I turned them all down, sent every nickel back. And I decided that uh, that was going to be part of the statement I felt was necessary when I ran for office. So I won in the primary and I won in the general election and off to hell and I went, right? Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, very optimistic about what the possibilities were. In a state where your legislators make $10.33 an hour and we do everything we can to make sure we're earning it, okay? in a state where the directions from my house to the Capitol are left at the cow, right? Everybody knows where that is, right? And so when I got to Helena, what I found was more of the same, only maybe on steroids a little bit. What I found was a lot of special interest, a lot of people trying to twist our arms, and a lot of people trying to influence my vote and my opinion. And those people weren't from Kalispell, Many of them weren't even from Montana. I thought that was a little odd, too. And along the way, I received these um, offers to uh, sign pledges. Wasn't real big on those, because I really felt like my contract was with the people that voted for me in my district. It's kind of the way I left it with them. So I declined, in particular, one pledge. And so this out-of-state special interest group decided that wasn't maybe quite enough for them. So behind my back and without telling me, they decided to hold a special meeting in my community while I was in session. Didn't invite me and didn't tell me, even though they said it was to try to educate me on, on the issue, right? Now, why would you do that? Why, if I'm the one you're supposed to educate, wouldn't you tell me and wouldn't you invite me? I am a great party guest, okay? <laughs> So I decided in the middle of the session to drive home that night on the winter roads to welcome and greet those people to the good city of Kalispell. And I showed up to tell them that I wasn't going to sign their pledge, and I didn't appreciate the way they did their business. And I had a bunch of my friends show up along with me, and they shared with them pretty much the same opinion, right? They kind of want to know who is trying to influence their vote who's trying to influence their opinion, and who specifically is trying to influence mine. And so at the end of that, I decided this was an opportunity for me, a guy who really never had this on his radar screen, to go back to Helena and try to make a difference. I was haunted by a picture in our local weekly newspaper 
the flathead beacon that had a hand on a pair of puppet strings over the top of the Capitol, right? That's the perception people have of our political process, and I refuse to be the guy who stands there silently to watch our political process be auctioned off. I won't do it. If the point was to get my attention, it worked. They got my attention. So I went back and offered, um, was actually asked and agreed to help carry the Disclose Act on the House floor as a freshman. Now that was difficult because not everybody agreed with me. Many of those people, based on principle, they're good people, we don't agree on this issue. But they don't have a corner on the principle market. And my principals told me that unlimited cash, particularly from those people who want to hide in the shadows and try to influence our political system, the people in it and the people at home isn't a good thing, right? Even my mom didn't have to teach me that. I, I think I knew that intuitively. And so we had a chance through the Disclose Act to shine a little light on the darkness that is campaign finance, right? and say, if you're going to try to influence my vote, if you're going to try to influence the people back home, you're going to have to stand by it. We're going to have to know who you are. You're going to have to report. And we're going to know what is um, the kind of political speech that is intended to influence our elections and the uh, people we send to represent us. And if you remember, it wasn't too long ago, uh, was it 2012, and I think it was I-166, that was an initiative where the people of Montana <laughs> decided, if you can believe this, that our rights are reserved to people and corporations are not people. 75% of the people of Montana agree, right? And so one of the things I did learn, because I see one of my high school teachers in here, is that much math, <laughs> and I know 75 is more than 25, okay? <laughs> It's an important issue to the people of Montana. It's an important issue to me. Because you see, I'm laboring under the delusion still that the single mom on Meridian Road, that the person over on Fifth Avenue East in my town should have the same access to our system, the same amount of influence as the person that sits at the head of the corporate desk. it's a freedom of speech issue, you bet, right? And what happens is that gal over on Meridian Road, her speech is crushed by the sheer volume of what others can bring to the table, particularly those that hide behind the curtain and try to pull the levers, right? It's the consequences of sleeping next to an elephant, right? And they're hard to avoid. So. What I've looked at is, what are the opportunities? How do we change? Because no complaining, that's one of my rules I'm trying to hold myself to, right? No complaining without offering a solution. So I'm here tonight to hear what those potential solutions are, right? What can we do about it? What can we do to make sure that those people in my community are the ones we listen to, are the ones that have the priority, are the ones that drive the agenda, are the ones that tell me what to do? That's what I'm here to find out. I'm here tonight to find out how we can make sure that the will of the people that was expressed through that initiative that I just told you about, right, becomes the rule of law in this state, becomes a guiding principle for us uh, that are involved in the legislative process. So I appreciate being here tonight and being given this opportunity, and I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a little less exciting, I'm going to read to you now. <laughs> it's kind of like grade school, though. You can follow along with me. So I'm going to start with a letter um, from Governor Bullock that he sent us regarding the issue of Citizens United. Dear friends, I'm honored to be a host of tonight's event and regret that I am not able to be with you in person. 
Open and honest elections are a part of Montana's history. From the Copper Kings 100 years ago to the corporate kings of today, Montanans have made it our mission to defend our elections, ensuring they remain open, honest, and transparent. As you know, the recent US Supreme Court decision has allowed dark money groups to corrupt our system and are making our elections look more like auctions. It's time Montanans again break this 21st century version of the copper collar and show the country a path forward to taking back our democracy. Last year, I worked with a bipartisan group of lawmakers to pass the Disclose Act to require the disclosure of all donations to any independent group spending money on state level elections. As Attorney General, I led the effort to preserve Montana's 100 year old Corrupt Practices Act, taking the case for our state's citizen democracy all the way to the US Supreme Court. I also defended Montana's campaign finance limits and disclosure laws against a wave of lawsuits filed by American Traditions Partnership and other dark money groups. It has been six years since the disastrous Citizens United decision and the corrupting impact of that action is being felt more than ever. I will continue to fight for fair, transparent, and accessible elections because I, along with all Montanans, believe that our election should be decided by we the people, not a small number of wealthy people who seek to hide their money and motivations. Sincerely, Governor Steve Bullock. And now, Senator John Tester's letter. Thank you for allowing me to share a few words, and thank you for your hard work to restore our democracy to the people. Let me be clear. Citizens United is the worst Supreme Court decision in my lifetime. This decision has allowed corporations and the wealthy few to drown out the voices of regular American citizens. That's not what the founders of this country envisioned. The unimaginable amount of money that has flooded into our elections since Citizens United has brought with it corruption, quid pro quos, and confirmation that some elected officials put their donors in front of the folks they represent. In fact, today's campaign finance system breeds lawmakers who listen to wealthy donors at the expense of their constituents. It elects folks from the political extremes who refuse to work together. The lack of compromise keeps us from tackling big issues, like our budget and our education system, that must be addressed if we want America to remain a world leader. But in order to address these challenges, we need to overturn Citizens United and pass a constitutional amendment that clearly states corporations are not people. I am proud to sponsor this constitutional amendment in the Senate, and I will continue to fight alongside of you to reform our campaign finance system, remove dark money from politics, and restore our government to the people. Thank you, and keep up the great work. Senator John Tester. Retired Justice on the Montana Supreme Court, and I want to talk a, a little bit tonight to you about Citizens United, what the case is actually about. Everybody hears the name. I know everybody knows what the case actually involved, and the consequences and fallout from that. So on Ju January 21, 2010, the Supreme Court of the United States issued one of the worst decisions in the last 100 years. Indeed, in terms of the potential harm, the court's decision is likely the most dangerous decision ever issued in our nation's history. Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. We're gathered here this evening to discuss why that is true and to examine what we, the people, can do about it. First, let me briefly describe what the case is all about. Citizens United was a wealthy nonprofit that ran a political action committee with millions of dollars in assets and produced and promoted an anti-Hillary Clinton documentary movie. Clinton was a candidate for president. Citizens United wanted to make the film available through video on demand within 30 days of the primary election. The Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002 prohibited electioneering communications within 30 days of the last primary election and within 60 days 
before the general election. Citizens United challenged the constitutionality of this ban, along with the act's dis disclaimer and disclosure requirements. The federal district court upheld the law and Citizens United's appeal reached the Supreme Court. Importantly, at no time other than 30 days before the primary uh, uh, was uh, Citizens United's free speech rights implicated. The only issue before the Supreme Court was whether Citizens United had the right to use funds from its general treasury to pay for broadcasts during the 30-day period, and the court could have disposed of a case on that basis. Instead, in what can only be described as gross judicial activism, the court sent the case back to the district court to be rebriefed on the broader issue of whether the act was facially unconstitutional. Having then before it the question that the court really wanted to decide, the court held the act was unconstitutional as being a ban on corporate independent expenditures and a suppression of protected corporate political free speech. The fallout from that decision and other decisions which have followed ushered in the unprecedented use of dark individual and institutional mega money expenditures to influence elections and to effectively silence the voices of individual small contributors and ordinary voters. The decision has chipped away at expenditure and contribution limits imposed by Congress and the states such as Montana upon individuals, corporations, unions, special interest groups, nonprofits, and trade associations. Citizens United has resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars pouring into elections with little or no disclosure of the source of the funding and with little, if any, accountability for the truth and accuracy of the information and messages promulgated. Indeed, and Representative Garner uh, referred to this, Candidates are being marketed to voters in the same fashion that fast food and pharmaceuticals are hawked to consumers. To quote Warren Sussman, we have changed from a culture of character into a culture of personality. Here are the basic premises that the court relied upon in reaching its decision. First, contributions paid directly to a candidate breed corruption quid pro quo. In other words, I give you money, I buy your vote. Back in the day, it was called bribery. However, that same majority decreed that expenditures made on behalf of a candidate do not have any such corruptive effect because the individual or entity is spending the money simply providing the public with information about a candidate or issue. Second, relying on a 1976 decision, Buckley versus Vallejo, the court held that money is a form of and counts as speech. The court stated, and I want to quote here, a restriction on the amount of money a person or group can spend on political communication during a campaign necessarily reduces the quantity of expression by restricting the number of issues discussed, the depth of their exploration, and the size of the audience reached. And the court went on. And again, I quote, the electorate's increasing dependence on television, radio, and other mass media for news and information has made these expensive forms of communication indispensable instruments of effective political speech. So, following this analysis through to its logical conclusion, the more money one can spend, the more speech one can buy and thus has. In other words, money equals speech. Partisan corporate and special interests can expend mega do dollars to elect a favorite candidate or defeat a candidate who will not support the expender's agenda. Ordinary citizens have no such ability. As a further consequence of these two premises, the ordinary voter's $50 contribution or letter to the editor doesn't mean much in the face of a multi-million dollar slick TV ad campaign. In reality, the speech and voice of the ordinary citizen are drowned out by the quantity of speech orchestrated in the national and local media by the mega money speakers. The Center for Responsive Politics reports that more and more of the funding of national elections 
is coming from large institutional and individual donors and less from small donors and from candidates themselves. Indeed, traditional campaign funding has been hijacked by unaccountable dark mega money interests. Moreover, the ideal of one person, one vote must contemplate that voters have an equal ability to participate at all stages of the process to elect their public officers and, their, and that their votes are not weighted or devalued by those who vote with their dollars. But the fact is that one one hundredth of one percent of the voting age population is funding the massive media attack ad driven theater that we characterize as campaigns for public office. Less than one percent of Americans are contributing eighty percent of the campaign funds. Indeed, in the 2012 election cycle, nearly 30 percent of all disclosed political contributions came from just over 30,000 people. That in a nation of over 310 million people. That means that 1% of 1% of moneyed interests were the kingmakers for public office in the United States. They determine who gets nominated and ultimately who gets elected. Citizens United also applies to judicial elections in those states such as Montana that elect trial and appellate judges. Two empirical nonpartisan studies sponsored by the American Constitution Society, one called Justice at Risk and the other called Skewed Justice, Citizens United, Television Advertising, and State Supreme Court Justices, Decisions in Criminal Cases, have clearly demonstrated, clearly demonstrated that money expended to influence state judicial elections drives justices' decisions favor of the expenders in civil cases and against criminal defendants. And judges who are sworn to impartiality, fairness, independence, and to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law are thus affected. Can there be any legitimate basis for believing that those elected to the two political branches would be free from similar corruption? Indeed, only fools or the Citizens United majority could believe in such rationality. And to this point, substantial dark money and independent expenditures have been made in judicial races in Montana. In 2000, the 2012 election, a super PAC spent nearly $900,000, uh, both lives out of state, and one out of state individual spent $100,000 in support of Justice McKinnon. Uh, in the 2014 election between incumbent Mike Wheat and his challenger Lawrence Van Dyke, $1.36 million was expended by groups other than the candidates. Collectively, the candidates themselves raised and spent about $250,000. In 2014, that Supreme Court race was the most expensive Supreme Court race in Montana's history, and in that cycle, it was the most expensive race for state of office. This year, there are three seats up for election, Chief Justice McGrath and Justice Jim Shea, are running unopposed. They are running for retention. But in other elections of this type in other states, the candidate has been thrown out of office by a last minute, well orchestrated no vote. There is also an election for the seat being vacated by Justice Pat Cotter. There are two candidates for this seat. The extent to which dark mega money will play in these elections has yet to be seen. But if the last two elections are any guide, Dark mega money and independent expenditures by out of state organizations and individuals will play a huge role. No doubt you will hear from many candidates their fervent disavowal of super PAC and dark money. Candidates pledge transparency in all of their campaign contributions. Uh, but you should know, however, that wrapping oneself in the mantle of transparency is in many cases a little more than sanctimonious nonsense. And here's why. The law provides that independent expenditures cannot be made in cooperation, consultation, or concert with, or at the request or suggestion of, a candidate, the candidate's authorized committee, or their agents, or a political party, or its agents. That's what, exactly what the law says. Now, if a candidate wants to tear up or return direct contributions lawfully made to his campaign, by all means, shred and return away. But when it comes to independent expenditures made on behalf of his or her campaign, 
by individuals, corporations, special interests, or super PACs, Citizens United guarantees that the candidate's wishes, pledges, promises, or disavows mean virtually nothing. For one thing, as noted, the law requires that the candidate have absolutely nothing to do with the independent expenditures. That's why it's called independent. If he or she violates this law, then the Commissioner on Political Practices or the Attorney General gets involved. On the other hand, if XYZ Corporation or Super PAC Americans for Motherhood and Apple Pie want to make an independent expenditure to fund a slick TV ad for candidate A, candidate A's disavowal and pledge not to accept institutional or PAC money is smoke and mirrors. The reason? Because under Citizens United, the independent expender, expender has a First Amendment free political speech right to inform the electorate and the electorate, according to the Supreme Court, has a right to be informed, irrespective of whether candidate A agrees or not. Indeed, if it's a true independent expenditure, the candidate can't stop it, even if he or she is self-funding his or her own campaign. And if, as is the usual case, there's no disclosure of the names of the individuals actually behind the independent expenditure, then we have classic dark money. Remember. I'm closing up here. According to the Supreme Court, a contribution corrupts, but, a, but an expenditure has no corruptive effect. <laughs> well, for those living in a parallel universe, that nuance may make sense, but in reality, it is a dichotomy grounded in a consummate fiction. By either definition, the contributor or the expender is using money to influence an election and to secure a vote in favor of or against the candidate or issue. Again, aside from fools or the Citizens United majority, does anyone actually believe the candidates are oblivious to who is expending money for or against them? And can any thinking person doubt that when millions upon millions of dollars are expended on behalf of a candidate, that he is or she is bought, that is bribed, as surely as if the office seeker were handed a bushel basket of cash under the table. So the fallout of Citizens United is indisputable. The wolf of money, dressed up in the sheep's clothing of corporate political free speech, is driving and corrupting our elections, our political processes, our public officials, and our courts. It is drowning out the voices of ordinary citizens. It is responsible for the flood of false information misleading media, and it is devaluing and diluting the franchise of ordinary voters. In short, money corrupts, and enough of it corrupts absolutely. If we really believe in and value the notion of government of, by, and for the people, not corporations, super PACs, and special interests, but human beings, then we must cause the 28th Amendment to be adopted to undo the calamity that the Supreme Court has forced upon America. Citizens United must be, must be constitutionally overruled, and we, the people, must take up the challenge to overrule it. And that's where my colleague Jeff Clements is going to go next. Okay. Tough act to follow. Thank you, Justice Nelson, Representative Gardner. Thank you very much. I'm Jeff Clements. I'm president of American Promise. Uh, we are and chair of Free Speech for People. American Promise is a national, nonpartisan, actually cross-partisan organization dedicated to helping support, connect, and network Americans who want to do what Justice Nelson just said, win the 28th Amendment to renew our democracy. Um, I'd like to um, talk more about that, uh, but it, you'll forgive me, I hope, for talking a lot about Montana tonight. It's not shameless flattery. Um, it is actually uh, a model for what American Promise is trying to do and trying to replicate across the country. I think America has a lot to learn from Montana, and it's a great honor to be here um, with you all. and. Um, tell you what you already know, but I think it's, uh, tell you about your history here from Boston to tell you about Montana, but it, it, if you'll bear with me, it'll make sense, I think. Um, so, you know, I, 
what you're going to hear essentially is about um, a certain clarity, and we heard it already. We heard it from Representative Garner. We heard it from Jim Nelson. Um, it, plain spoken doesn't actually do it justice. It's like a laser beam. What is really at stake? It's not a campaign finance problem. You know, it's not a policy problem. It's fundamentally an American promise broken or delivered by us in our time. And that promise is the one all the way back to the revolution, that we're going to be equal citizens governing together in a republic. And that's what's at stake. And that's why we need a constitutional amendment. Lots of good reforms are important. Disclosure, dark money being stopped, um, public funding if people want to explore that as some states are doing. It's a good idea and works in many places. Lots of good ideas. But if we don't repair the foundation on which reforms stand, and th then, then we can't succeed, not only with those reforms long term, but with the whole American experiment. We can't succeed if we don't have reform standing on top of a constitutional foundation of equal human beings governing ourselves together. And Citizens United says that's not actually what the American promise is, as you heard before. Citizens United says we're not equal citizens. Um, the woman Representative Garner talks about um, her free speech is gone. Um, that's not equal citizenship. Our representation isn't equal. All the things that we um, know are part of our promise are we're being told, well, you're wrong. And so that is why it's a constitutional crisis, not just a policy situation. And how we're going to win the 28th Amendment is by doing, uh, I'll shamelessly put it, more of Montana here and around the country. And so, when I was here a few years ago, let me, let me now say some examples of what I mean by Montana. And if, if we can bring your example, double down on it right here. Do, you, you, you know, we have more work to do here in Montana. But if we can do more of what you do here across the country, we will have the 28th Amendment and soon. And we will overturn Citizens United. And this dark period of our history will be in the history books as that catastrophic mistake the Supreme Court did and that heroic effort that Americans did to fix it. Um, so. Um, when I was here a few years ago in Missoula, actually in this law school, I believe, a, a gentleman came up to me um, and gave me a copy of your state constitution. And it was kind of well-worn and well-read, clearly. And he signed it and said he helped write it. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, is it you? <laughs> there he is. He's here tonight. Good to see you. <laughs> I hope you don't mind a plug, because he did just what he did tonight. And he said, I helped write it. And I said, wow, that's really So I went back and looked at that. And um, how did that happen? And I learned, of course, that you already know, um, but we all should know more of, um, that in 1972, you had a constitutional convention and uh, had a, your state constitution was written by the people of Montana, specifically your delegates, who I learned were included 24 lawyers. It's, Justice Nelson and I always think lots of lawyers are pretty good to have in certain instances, and maybe that's one of them. But that's not all. 20 farmers and ranchers, 17 business owners, 13 teachers, 11 housewives, four ministers, a grad student, and a beekeeper were the delegates to that constitutional convention. And I think, and I understand, and, and Jim Nelson has confirmed this for me, that it is one of the most people-friendly, best state constitutions in the country. So. I think James Madison and John Thomas Jefferson and millions of Americans came before us are somewhere up there smiling at what we are capable of as a people, as citizens uh, in this country. Um, and so that James Madison, you know, he said, um, the principal draftsman of the con U.S. Constitution, architect really of the federalism and the, and the treks and balances, um, along with, I have to say, from Boston, John Adams. Um, uh, and, um, but James Madison wrote w once that um, constitutional amendments must be reserved only for extraordinary occasions. Uh, but he made sure we had Article 5 in the U.S. Constitution so that when we faced extraordinary occasions, we could respond. And that's what we face now uh, of our own. And so um, what can we learn from Montana? Uh, let's start with other extraordinary occasions. In 1905, of course, you were one of the first states to enact the um, popular 
referendum, the ballot initiative, to be able to bypass legislatures that were no longer capable of representing the people and, and, and vote directly. In 1912, you used this authority to uh, enact the Corrupt Practices Act, which is no longer the law after a century because the Supreme Court of the United States used Citizens United to say it doesn't apply anymore. Your Corrupt Practices Act is dead, thanks to Citizens United. But from 1912 to 2012, 100 years, it helped change Montana from what was uh, acknowledged widely to be something of a corporate oligarchy with the copper barons and so on to one of the most robust, effective citizen democracies in the country. And um, so that wasn't all. And now I want to tie the Montana e example to the amendments. Um, in 1913, around that same time, uh, Montana men voted to give equal voting rights to Montana women. And Montana men and women became the electorate that was a full seven years before the 19th Amendment did that for the entire United States. Montana was in the lead on that. Montana, in the same time, 1913 again, um, said, uh, and you knew because of your experience, that indirect election appointment of U.S. senators was dominated by special interests and corporate money. And you led the way to the 17th Amendment to the United States Constitution so that Americans could elect senators again. In 1913, again, it was quite a year, the election of uh, Jeanette Rankin, the first woman ever in the United States Congress. And um, that just plain spoken, the way these two gentlemen did today, plain spoken understanding of basically right and wrong you know, we're equal or we're not equal. And you know the difference. We all know the difference. And the thing about Montana is you just don't pretend that it's not there. You act, you fix it. You stand up, you fix it. And that's what you've been doing with Citizens United and I um, trust will keep doing. Um, now, if you'll just indulge me in a bit of um, a story that I hope won't be a shaggy dog story about when I first met Jim Nelson, uh, because I think this shows the spirit of 1913, 1912, those Montanans lives very much in your hearts and what you've done to drive the 28th Amendment forward, not just here, but all over the country. Um, in 2009, I had just left the Attorney General's office where I'd been Chief of the Public Protection Bureau in Massachusetts to return to private practice. And um, at my first uh, brief uh, was in the Supreme Court in an obscure campaign finance case called Citizens United at the time. It, it didn't become obscure, of course. But, um, and uh, after the court's shocking decision, I helped found Free Speech for People. We began organizing a national 28th Amendment campaign. We needed um, to have good, strong voices of both parties. We knew right from the beginning, you do not win constitutional amendments with a 51-49 vote. You get the American consensus and, and drive it to win it. That means we need Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Americans standing together. So we got a letter from attorneys generals all over the, um, all over the country, Republicans, Democrats. They wrote a letter to Congress calling for the 28th Amendment shortly after Citizens United. Steve Bullock, Attorney General of Montana, was on that letter. And we testified. Uh, the, the, the 28th Amendment, a version of it, was actually introduced two weeks after that in, in Congress. And Steve Bullock came to Washington where I first saw him. He was attorney general at the time, testifying in a committee hearing on this constitutional amendment. And you know, in those gloomy days um, when the money was already piling up, corporations were starting to spend the money, this idea of super PACs started being formed. It was like a blast of fresh air from the West, I have to say. He said that Montanans, in his testimony, Montanans know very well what Citizens United is about and know right away what the, where this is leading. Um, they, we know what it's like to live in a place where corporations can dominate and we worked very, very hard to make sure that ended in 1912. And he said, I'm going to defend this Corrupt Practices Act uh, that Citizens United could not have meant that states don't no longer have the ability to ensure fair elections. Well, sure enough, he was promptly sued by 
one of Jim Nelson's mom and apple pie <laughs> front groups um, to say that that violated Citizens United. We filed a brief in the case. Uh, the Attorney General's office led the defense. They did a magnificent job. Anthony Johnstone, now at the law school here, did a magnificent job defending that case, defending Montana's Corrupt Practices Act. We filed an amicus brief, um, which is a friend of the court brief, in support, arguing that corporations don't have constitutional rights of human beings, that we must be able to regulate money in, in politics um, or lose our rights as equal citizens. And we were joined on that brief in the Montana Supreme Court by a, a business uh, called Mike's Thriftway. Anyone from Chester, Montana? Uh, Mike's Thriftway in Chester, owned by Margaret and, and uh, Mike Novak. Um, who wanted to be on the brief to say, look, we're business people too. We know corporations are useful in the economy, but we know the difference between corporations and human beings. So they joined us on that brief along with business associations as well. And so we filed that in the court. The proceedings worked their way up to the Supreme, Judici Supreme Court of Montana, which at the time, of course, Justice Nelson was on. We were hopeful. Uh, it was a chance to stop Citizens United in its tracks, perhaps. And um, lo and behold, we won in the Montana Supreme Court, again, thanks to the Attorney General's and his team's um, defense. And I thought that was great. I started reading the decision. This is great. And then I, I said this, and basically the Montana Supreme Court said, well, Citizens United was a federal law, and we're looking at this case anew, and Montana has this rich and not you know, bad history of corruption that we fixed, and we have a different record. So it's distinguishable. It wasn't a direct attack on Citizens United. It was saying, this case is a little different, and the Supreme Court must not have meant to strip the states of the traditional state authority over corporations and state elections. Um, well, then I got to this dissent, and it said Justice Jim Nelson in dissent. And I thought, oh my, I, I, I had heard he's so good. <laughs> what, what a, he's, he's dissenting, he, he likes Citizens United, and I'm reading on, and he's, he's, he's explaining why Citizens United is the law of the land, and, and that, you know, that there's no difference in this case, and, and that there's no special rule for Montana, that the Citizens United means exactly what it sounds like it means, that we the people are stripped of our rights as people to limit money in our elections and that corporations have constitutional rights and the Montana law no longer can apply. And I just went on like, with more and more disappointment. It sounded so awful, he's applying Citizens United. And then finally, um, you know, well into his opinion, Justice Nelson uh, made clear he had a little more to say on it. And he said, I have never had to write a more frustrating dissent. Well, as a member of this court, I'm bound to follow Citizens United. I do not have to agree with the Supreme Court's decision. And to be absolutely clear, I do not agree with it, which we now know if you heard him tonight. He uh, doesn't have a nuanced opinion about Citizens United, and he's quite right about it. Uh, but he said something that this is, again, an example. If across the country we stand up and say exactly what's right, just as Justice Nelson did in this opinion, uh, even albeit a dissenting opinion, um, we will have the 28th Amendment soon. He said, for starters, the notion that corporations are disadvantaged in the political realm is unbelievable. Indeed, it has astounded most Americans. The truth is that corporations have inordinate power in Congress and in state legislatures. It is hard to tell where government ends and corporate America begins. Freedom of speech is now synony synonymous with freedom to spend. Speech equals money. Money equals democracy. That's how we summarize Citizens United. This was decidedly not the view of the constitutional founders, he said. Now, closing his opinion, Justice Nelson said, now I have to say something about corporate personhood. While I recognize this doctrine is firmly entrenched in the law, I find the entire concept offensive. Corporations are creations of the law. As such, they should enjoy only those powers, not constitutional rights, but legislatively conferred powers that are concomitant with their legitimate function, that being limited liability investment vehicles for business. Then he said this, human beings are persons. It is an affront to the inviolable dignity of our species that courts have created a legal fiction which forces people, human beings, to share fundamental natural rights with soulless creations of government. So he 
gave me a scare, but he came around in the end. <laughs> and uh, you know, his prophetic warning about Citizens United, he was right actually on both counts. He was right that Citizens United meant exactly what it said. He was right there is no Montana exception. The case went up to the US Supreme Court, summarily reversed the Montana Supreme Court without even a hearing. No hearing after 100 years of your law, the Supreme Court said no. Unfortunately, Justice Nelson was right about that, but he was right about what Citizens United meant. And then he retired from the Supreme Court, and we were delighted, honored, and grateful that he joined the Board of Free Speech for People and the Advisory Board of American Promise. So that's an example of the Montana uh, <laughs> Just like Representative Garner says, uh, you don't complain, you roll up your sleeves and you do something. You say the truth and then you try to fix it. And that's what Justice Nelson, Representative Garner, and so many of you are doing. So that, I'm here to say why we need the 28th Amendment, but this is really about how we get the 28th Amendment. There's no other way. It's a very hard process. We need two thirds of Congress to pass the amendment. We need three quarters of the states to ratify it. But the reason I emphasize the Montana experience is because you've done it before, over and over again. We as a country have done it before. Eight times we've overturned the Supreme Court with amendments. 27 amendments, including our Bill of Rights, weren't in the Constitution. The American people made them get in there by winning constitutional amendments, just the same way we're going to do this one. And so I think uh, we just, the, the lesson is we need to just keep standing up and saying the truth, just as Justice Nelson and Representative Gardner and you all did on November, in November 2012 with I-166. Um, and that's um, another Montana example. I tell you, I've told this story all over the country and it's, uh, it's inspiring to Americans when they hear this. People know if they're talking to their neighbors and friends that doesn't matter what your political party is. You get what's going on, and you know it has to change. You know Citizens United is wrong. But then people feel like this must be, we can't ever get two-thirds of Congress. It's too partisan. Nothing can get through Congress. Well, you in Montana proved that the, the idea, the thinking, that the feeling everyone had that, well, maybe people I don't agree with on anything else actually agree on this one. You proved it. And on that day, after the Supreme Court throughout your law after 100 years. Um, you went to work, didn't complain, went to work, got it on the ballot initiative, passed the 28th Amendment resolution, I-166. And it said, uh, it's this, um, it established a state policy, your state policy today because of that initiative is this, that corporations are not entitled to constitutional rights because they're not human beings. It charges and I'm quoting, Montana elected and appointed officials, state and federal, to implement that policy. With this policy, the people of Montana established there should be a level playing field in campaign spending, in part by prohibiting campaign, corporate campaign contributions and expenditures, and by limiting political spending in elections. Further, and again I'm quoting from your resolution that you passed in November 2012, Further, Montana's congressional delegation is charged with proposing a joint resolution offering a constitutional amendment to establish that corporations are not human beings entitled to constitutional rights and to implement this policy. So that day in November, you voted for Mitt Romney by more than 10 points for president, and you voted for this, as Representative Garner pointed out, 75% to 25%. The country saw that Americans are together on this. So. So Montana's right, you are right, we need the constitutional amendment. And uh, I want to, um, one of the things American Promise tries to do is help support um, with facts, law, whatever you need, your work in the states, in your community, to spread the word, to organize. So let us know what we can do. But one of the things we try to do is emphasize this was not just a one-time mistake. I mean, you learned it the hard way in Montana. People thought Citizens United, they must have just made a terrible mistake. As soon as they get our case from Montana, they'll fix it, they'll overturn it, and of course they didn't. And you're not alone. Um, and a short, at the same time, Arizona learned the same hard lesson about the states no longer have the powers that the states traditionally have in a federal system. Arizona had a clean elections law. 
I mean, in some public financing for your candidates, trying to preserve a citizen's legislature. You didn't have to, you know, go to PACs or you didn't have to go to corporations or wealthy people. You could raise a little money and then get a match of public money so you could run independently of the special interests and represent your constituents. Well, after Citizens United, those independent so-called expenditures that Jim Nelson described started flooding in and breaking the system. You know, you can't um, effectively run a system like that if you're having millions of dollars of outside money pouring into it. Because one of the deals is if you agree to be a clean elections candidate, you don't take any private contributions. So, but if money can pour in against you, it's very hard to make that work. So Arizona did something creative. They said, well, well, if that happens, we'll have an additional match so that we'll have more speech, right? So that if there's a big outside expenditure, we'll enable the public candidates to be able to respond a little bit. And so there was a little bit of a match so that a candidate who got bombarded with those outside attacks could actually have some resources to respond. Went up to the Supreme Court a claim that that violated the free speech rights of essentially the argument is, and I'm only a tiny bit exaggerating, the right of wealthy people and corporations to drown out everybody else. Um, and, and, and I'm not kidding. Uh, you know, Montana's policy is a level playing field, right? We should have a level playing field. That's what equal citizenship is about. Our politics should be a level playing field. Anyone can run for office. You represent constituents. Um, and the uh, uh, Arizona um, was trying to do that. Here's what happened in the Supreme Court when it was um, alleged to be a violation of the wealthy people's right to drown people out. Chief Justice Roberts, uh, you know, usually, as Justice Nelson will tell you, the court wait, hears the arguments from the parties. You don't go off and conduct your own investigation and look for evidence. You, that's what the lawyer's job, and you're supposed to be the umpire as Chief Justice Roberts described himself when he was trying to be appointed and confirmed he was going to be an umpire. Well, in that argument um, before the Supreme Court about the Arizona clean elections law, Chief Justice Roberts, in oral argument, triumphantly announced he'd been on the internet that morning. And he had gone to the Arizona clean elections website. And he saw that they said, and this is a direct quote, I checked the Citizens Clean Elections website this morning and it said the act was to level the playing field when it comes to running for office. If you hear that, you think, oh, Chief Justice Roberts is coming around. He's good, right? But then he continues, why isn't that clear evidence that the law is unconstitutional? That's a direct quote. And the Arizona Clean Elections Law was struck down. You are not allowed to level the playing field. That is a violation of the brand new First Amendment, because as Chief Justice Roberts said, that would discourage people from spending money um, in an election, spending big money, if it was able to be balanced, and that would violate the free speech rights of those who might spend big money. So no level playing field allowed. Um, the court struck again a few years later, not a few years, a year later, in the McCutcheon case. Um, there is a law, the federal law stood for a long time, decades, that said, contributors to federal candidates can have to stop when they get to $123,000 total. You know, the aggregate of all the different congressional races. It's called the aggregate limit. So, you know, you can, as they, as they say in the fundraising world, max out to the senators and to the representatives. Um, and then you can go max out with senators. You know, as Representative Garner said, you often get outside. They're not even from your state, but they have an, you know, they want to get something. So they're writing checks to the senators. And so, but there was a law that said you can, you can do that, but when you hit $123,000 total, you have to stop because there was a worry about the corrupting effect of that, sort of undue influence in the party and that sort of thing. Well, that was claimed to be a violation of the free speech rights of those who want to go well past $123,000. And they won another 5-4 decision saying that the limit violated the rights of wealthy donors who wish to purchase what Justice Kennedy on the court calls ingratiation and access. He doesn't mean that's a bad thing. <laughs> ingratiation and access, he says, are not corruption, nothing wrong with it. You're not allowed to limit $123,000. So if you have felt restricted in your speech because you could only spend $123,000 a year on politicians, you are free at last. And you know, <laughs> bear in mind, $123,000 is more than three times the annual 
total median wage of more than 100 million Americans, a total annual wage of 100 million Americans. Um, and that is considered to be a free speech violation if we try to say, you know, maybe leave a little room for others to speak. This is why we need the 28th Amendment, and I think we need to appreciate it's not a one-time mistake. This is a concerted push that will require a concerted push back, as you in Montana have done. So those are the stakes, and that's the first biggest, biggest step to winning of how do we win a 28th Amendment. We define the problem right. It's not just a court mistake. It's not going to be fixed easily, even with a new justice. If we get a new justice someday, it won't be fixed easily by a court. And it's not really healthy, you know, for the judiciary to go back and forth, 5-4, five, 5-4. Four, five, four. It's not supposed to be political like that. Um, so, you know, I hope that Citizens United decision is overturned uh, by a new justice, a new court. Um, but it's not a good strategy in place of continuing and doubling down on the work for the 28th Amendment for a number of reasons. We have a consensus on the 28th Amendment. You proved it in Montana. It's been proved in Colorado, same thing, 75-25. It's been proved in 17 states. New York just became the 17th state in a cross-partisan resolution to call on Congress for the 28th Amendment. 700 cities and towns have passed resolutions calling for the 28th Amendment. It's an excellent way to do it. More resolutions in Montana towns, I highly recommend. Um, Janesville, Wisconsin, the hometown of House Speaker Paul Ryan, just passed a constitutional amendment resolution to overturn Citizens United. 80% vote for that. That's in Paul Ryan's hometown. Okay, so I think we can do this, we know we can do it, and we have to remember the problem. And don't get, let people sort of bog you down in, you know, campaign finance wonkery. It's about equal rights of Americans in our republic, and that's what we're fighting for. And that's what the amendments are for. You know, that's what we've always done, and that's what James Madison intended, is that we get these conflicts, constitutional conflicts, and there's only one way to answer them. They can't coexist, right? Citizens United can't coexist with our rights as equal citizens as we see them. Now, there may be people who feel otherwise, but as, mo as the 75, 80% people feel, I think, it's that they can't coexist. So we have to solve this constitutional crisis. There's two different viewpoints. Only one will survive. And the amendment is how we do that. It's how we've always done it. Can slavery exist consistent with a, our American promise of human liberty? No, we had to answer that with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Can, we, can, can half the population, women, have no right to vote and we still call ourselves, you know, deliverers of the American promise of human liberty and equal rights? No, we had to answer that. And there's no going backwards. Once you do the amendment, it's, con you know, that issue is resolved for all time. You know, we're not going back to women not voting. <laughs> we're not going back to slavery. You know, over and over again, we have moved forward with amendments, and that's what we have the opportunity to do. Um, and this isn't old, just old history. Poll tax, 1964, constitutional amendment. One last shameless flattery of Montana, the 26th Amendment, lowering the voting age, saying that, you know, 18, 19, and 20 year olds who are conscripted into the armed forces certainly will have a right to vote. And Senator Mike Mansfield helped lead that charge. Montana helped lead that charge. So these are how, amendments are how we resolve the questions that have to be answered. And so now it's our time. And at the, the Montana example I use, I'd urge you to keep doing, and, and, and with a little more specificity. So cross-partisan, absolutely essential. Um, Senator John Tester, I applaud him. We heard his letter. He's, right after that ballot initiative passed, he said, I hear you, introduce the constitutional amendment. By the way, the constitutional amendment, the 28th amendment, um, what it was, I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly read you um, what this, this one that said, it received 54 votes in the U.S. Senate uh, in September 2014. And section one of the amendment restores to the states and Congress and the, be the people the authority to limit and, uh, spending and contributions in elections. Um, and the reason it says, this is very important, it says in order to secure the political equality of all Americans and protect the integrity of our government. So that, you know, you heard a little bit about the Supreme Court 
tied itself all up in the difference between independent expenditures and contributions and quid pro quo corruption and ingratiation isn't corruption. And, and they've sort of gone down this road where almost no law can stand anymore. And what the amendment does is not just say we can you know, limit spending, it puts back into the Constitution that fundamental promise of political equality, and that will forever mean that we will much, be much better capable, it won't be nirvana, we'll be much better capable though of having effective campaign finance laws, fair representation, and a, a kind of citizen democracy. That amendment, oh, and section two, by the way, of that amendment says, and in passing, enacting those laws to defend political equality and, and fair uh, elections, we can distinguish between corporations and human beings, including banning political spending by corporations. So it's a good bill. It's a good 28th Amendment for sure. And it received 54 votes in the Senate. Um, it has 150 co-sponsors in the House. Um, this is real, folks. And you know we can really do this. And that is the big main step of how we do it, is believing we do it, and then keep it moving forward. So the direct challenge I, I offer, I suggest, um, with due respect as a visitor from Massachusetts, that um, you have uh, two representatives um, uh, who haven't signed on to the amendment yet. And it would be a game changer, I tell you, if they did. And it would be a game changer in a lot of ways. Um, so Senator Daines, Representative Zinke, um, are not on the amendment yet. Uh, they haven't said no, though, as far as I know. Um, and 75% of their constituents have said, it's our policy. We're instructing you. Um, I think it's hard, 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 as we know, to work across the aisle these days, especially in Washington. And that's why the Montana example is so good. So I don't say it to call them out or to cast blame or anything. Not at all, I, I promise you. Um, I say it because that suggests where the work is. We need to make it easier for our, uh, those who aren't on the amendment to get on the amendment and to celebrate and support them and when they do. And that means helping their constituents, their supporters, and that means lots of conversations that we have work to do as citizens. It's not to go finger point at them and say, why aren't you on the amendment? It's to talk with people who vote for them to say, you know, let's have a conversation about this. We, we know we agree. It's the American promise. We voted 75%. How can we help Representative Zinke and, and Senator um, Daines get on this um, amendment? Because if they did, it would break the dam, I think, in, in Washington. That's 54. We need 67 votes in the Senate. We need to get to 67. I think there are Republicans who will want to do this. Uh, and we just need the, some leaders. We have Walter Jones, Republican from North Carolina, on board already. Um, we have lots of Republicans. Um, as Representative Garner sh shows around the country, more you know, in the hundreds of representatives in state legislatures and local communities who voted for resolutions, um, Washington's a harder nut to crack for everything and everyone. We know that, but if we can help um, your representatives come across to get on this as a, um, a, a cross-partisan, as cross-partisan as it is here at home in Montana. I swear the country will not only notice, you'll see a quick movement to get this done. So I think that's the most important. I would urge and suggest the way to do it is the same way you got 75, 80% on the um, ballot initiative, and that's engaging the entire community. You know, faith leaders were writing op-eds, business people were speaking out, Republicans and Democrats were standing together, literally being videotaped, uh, John Bollinger and, and your governor, Brian Schweitzer, standing together to say, we're different parties, but we stand together on this. If you can do that and then do it with direction towards um, getting your representatives on board, we will be well on our way. California has a ballot initiative in November. I hope we'll see what we saw here. I think we will. Washington State has a ballot initiative in November. This is poised at a tipping point where we will see what happened in previous amendments. We're very rapidly, when it seems like it's really hard, never going to happen, suddenly it seems inevitable. We're almost at that tipping point if we can spread the Montana example around the country and if you can double down here. So thank you very much. It's great to be here with you.
Well, good evening. It's good to be back in Missoula. I recognize quite a number of familiar faces here. I was here at the Center for the Rocky Mountain West in the Mansfield Center from about 2005 until about uh, 2010 and a half, I think. My name is Bob Brown, and uh, I've been asked to be one of the responders to Justice Nelson and Jeff Clements, who, of course, have given us a wonderful and informative, both of them have given us wonderful and informative talks. <laughs> before I, well, actually, not quite even before I got involved in politics, I was a high school government teacher. And I remember the challenge of uh, explaining to the kids, I didn't spend much time on it, but you know, just in passing, that corporations are legal people. And the kids couldn't quite get that through their heads, and I think in part it was probably because I'd never completely got it through mine. Uh, but then it was just a business context. It didn't have anything to do with, you know, with, uh, with uh, conferring political rights on a corporation. I did spend more time as a high school teacher and what you've heard mentioned a lot here this evening, and that's the, the, uh, the Corrupt Practices Act that was passed by the people of Montana, one of the first citizens' initiatives that we ever passed in 1912. And most of you in here, I think, know where that, why that came about. We had the War of the Copper Kings in Montana, and we had uh, the two that were in a bidding war against each other uh, in almost every way. And one of them, uh, W.A. Clark, wanted to go to the U.S. Senate, and that was during the period when legislatures elected. He told me this is Grey Goose vodka. <laughs> it looks like it. <sighs> Thank you. But uh, anyway, and so W.A. Clark and, and, and Marcus Daly we're bribing the members of the legislature daily to keep uh, Clark going to the from going to the Senate, and Clark, of course, trying to buy the votes of the legislators to become a U.S. senator. And this got publicity all over the country. There had been similar kinds of situations, though not as flagrant or as, w as well publicized in other states beforehand. But Montana essentially became the poster child nationwide. Uh, for a need to have a direct election of U.S. Senators. Well, it wasn't long after that uh, that Clark was expelled from the U.S. Senate for what he was, I don't think he was ever actually committed, convicted of, of accepting bribes or rather or for paying bribes, but it was commonly known and he knew the case could be proven, so he resigned from the Senate. And do you know what he said when he left the U.S. Senate? Uh, stood up on the floor and angrily resigned, and he said, they've accused me of being a briber, but he said, I never bought a man who wasn't for sale. <laughs> <laughs> what a justification, huh? <laughs> but anyway, so the people of Montana then, smarting somewhat from this bad publicity, passed the Corrupt Practices Act, which was a citizen's initiative, and which occurred in 1912. And it, of course, prohibited corporations from being involved in political contests in Montana from that time forward. And it was blown away by Citizens United and essentially the, the, the Buckley versus Vallejo decision and Citizens United. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think most of us in this room would agree uh, Citizens United was the culmination of those two decisions and it was one of the worst decisions in U.S. history. Maybe since Dred Scott, perhaps the worst Supreme Court decision in American history. And we heard this evening, you think about that in the background, that 1% of the people in the United States, 1% of our population contributes 80% of the political money. I mean, what, how bizarrely unequal could that be? And they tell us in, in the Buckley versus Vallejo that money is speech, so therefore, that 1% must have speech equal to the, to the 80% of the people who can't make any kind of a contribution even remotely like that. And it seems like this would be so fundamentally wrong to people that, you know, that, 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 that those, those decisions couldn't stand. Well, guess what? Apparently it is. Because we've heard here this evening, we know from Montana's experience that 75% of us essentially voted to put the people back in charge of the, of the campaign contributions, or at least to give some kind of equality to political contributions. 
and I'm not sure what happened or exactly what passed in Zanesville, Ohio, but it was a similar kind of a thing. So I think the general public agrees that uh, that there shouldn't be unlimited campaign contributions, that corporations aren't people, and that, that money talks rather than people with real faces engaged in political speech. But we also know that in order to amend the Constitution, uh, it requires two-thirds of the members of Congress to pass a proposed constitutional amendment to the states, and then three-fourths of the states acting through their legislatures make the final determination about whether that amendment is added to the Constitution. And we can't get, what was it, 54 votes in the U.S. Senate? So that's a long ways from two-thirds of the members of the U.S. Senate. So it's a big job, a big, big, big job. But we can't count on the Supreme Court's membership changing. We don't know that will happen. And even if it does, we're not guaranteed that, that the decisions, especially Citizens United, can be reversed. And so, the only way to guarantee that the Supreme Court can't misinterpret the, the intent, I think, of the Constitution has been misinterpreted, but we've got to make it as plain as the nose on an anteater in the Constitution that, uh, that corporations aren't people and that you can't just have unlimited amounts of campaign contributions. And as has been pointed out, this is going to be a, a big and difficult job. A huge job, but I'm reminded of the story of, uh, and I'll close with this, uh, of uh, my political hero, Theodore Roosevelt, who one day took a ride out across the, uh, <coughs> the Potomac River Bridge over to the Virginia countryside, and he spent a couple of hours over there, and he came back and he showed the White House gardener an acorn that he said he'd picked up from a, the base of an oak tree over in Northern Virginia. And he told the gardener, he said that the, that the tree was, he thought, maybe as much as six feet in diameter. It was an incredible oak tree. And he said, uh, I want you to plant it here on the White House grounds. And the gardener said, well, Mr. President, don't you realize that it'd probably take two or 300 years for the tree to grow that, that big? And Roosevelt said, well, you better plant it this morning then. <laughs> well, that's what we need to do. We need to get started tomorrow morning on this important project because it's too important not to do. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Evan Barrett. I've been in and around the uh, political process since uh, 1969, and uh, uh, I've uh, known and been involved with Bob uh, for uh, most of that time. And I have the utmost respect for him. He's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. We've often been opponents. We've sometimes been allies. We've never been enemies. Never been. Out. We co-wrote a column you might have seen in the Missoulian this week, and if you didn't see it, go to the Missoulian website, put Bob and my name in on a search, and read it. That'll save me the time of reading it to you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> now, I look at around here, and a very important thing: uh, you are the most important citizen in America. And you are the most powerful citizen in America. Same for you and you. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what we have to strive to accomplish. It's not about money, it's about citizenship. Uh, democracy is about you. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, You know, we had a reference here before about, you know, it was pretty much a paraphrase of Lord Acton about power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the same it does apply to money. Too much money corrupts absolutely and changes this whole process. So you can just exchange money for power in that. Uh, the <coughs> I've got random notes here. It says to react, so I'm looking for what number six is here. <laughs> Uh, but uh, something to be recognized is the devil's always in the details. And there's something I always say that today's solution 
is tomorrow's problem. PACs were the solution in the early 1970s, right after Watergate. PACs were the solution. Now they're the problem. So whatever we do statutorily is going to ebb and flow and be problematic and we're going to find problems in it, which is another reason why the principles in a United States constitutional amendment are essential. Because they will hold, with all the vagaries and the changes in statute, principal language in the Constitution will hold. Uh, the uh, Citizens United took away the ability for states, by putting it in the Constitution through interpretation, for the states to be what they've been called many times, the laboratories of democracy. States are where you can try things out. We tried out by putting the 1912 Corrupt Practices Act that was good for 100 years. But we can't be the laboratories of democracy on this subject now, thanks to Citizens United, so we have to change the rules of the game so that states once again can be creative. Left to our own devices, we can take care of ourselves on this stuff. All the states are voting that way. But we need that constitutional amendment to allow us to have that opportunity. We can tweak our laws, but the door's got to be open for us to tweak those laws. You know, we tweaked them just this session with the Disclose Act. And keep in mind, there are folks around in Montana who want that act to be thrown out, who want every limitation to be thrown out, right now, because it's about political power. And power is an aphrodisiac, and people are addicted to it. Uh, This lift, constitutional amendment, two-thirds of each house, three-fourths of the legislatures, a big lift, a big lift. But it's something we can all do together. We talk about it being bipartisan or whatever. In the I will read one thing from the column Bob and I wrote. Clearly, fair elections are not a partisan issue. Montanans of all stripes, independents, Libertarians, Republicans, and Democrats want fair elections, free of the corrupting influence of big money and campaign money from corporations. That's where we are as a state. Now, how do we, what do we do about it? Uh, your point, we have, powerful as you are, and you're very powerful. You don't vote in the Congress. You have a representative democracy. So we have to persuade three people. One is persuaded. The other two need to be persuaded. I often tell some of my students now, when we talk about politics, that politicians are always willing to get out in front of a parade that's already been started. <laughs> we need to start a parade that they cannot ignore. So we'll have to start, every time you see, every time you have anyone in your family see anyone to see those two representatives we want to have change their mind and get on our side on this thing, they haven't declared themselves against it, make sure they feel the pressure of a parade that's moving fast because they'll respect that. And you, each individual powerful person here, Make that an important parade. So don't hesitate to exercise your power, which is your opinion. And let the, right now it's two people you want to tell. But we have to tell the world every way we can that Montana, what Montana stands for, we do it over and over and over again. But while we tell the world, let's tell two people and make them feel the pressure of the parade. Let's have uh, questions, okay? Thank you.
I think that was lovely. I really enjoyed it. We're, I apologize, we ran over. We had such great speakers. Uh, I would like permission from the group to do questions and answers if you want to stay. So we're like 90 plus minutes into this. And I feel bad about that, but we had some great speakers. So do you want to go to questions and answers for a few minutes? Okay, great. And I'd like the questions to be focused to our two primary speakers, at least in the beginning. Jeff, if you come up and if folks have questions for Jeff, he's been traveling around the country. We'll get the other, if you want to talk to some of the others, but I'd really, we have this special, unique opportunity with Jeff. Um, so if you have a question for Jeff, there's a, a, a mic over there. If you'd run over to that mic, whoever, we're going to just first comes first. Thank you so much. Hi. Oh, yep. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Snyder, and I'm running for House District 87 as a candidate. My question is, there's, I've been involved with a move to amend and uh, Wolfpack and other organizations that it's trying to do this nationwide. Are, do you have any affiliation, or are, is this an independent movement, or is this a together? I, I mean, are you working with these organizations, or is this? Yeah, so, so great question, Mark, and thank you for your running for office and stepping into that. Um, That's the least I can do. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, thank you. So um, the question is about other organizations, and so the answer is yes, um, many organizations, and that's a good thing. Some people think, oh, why don't we just have one organization to do it all? This, this is America. There's different views, different approaches, different strategies. Um, so, but we work together um, wherever we can. In, in California right now, and, in Washington State, those ballot initiatives are being supported by Move to Amend and Free Speech for People and Public Citizen, lots of different groups. Um, doesn't mean we all agree on every point on what the amendment should say or whether there should be a constitutional convention you know, or whether that's a dangerous idea. There's, those are good, important questions um, with, with um, out easy answers, but there's lots of good work to do to move it forward. American Promise is actually trying to serve citizens first, but also these different organizations and help create forums where those important conversations and work together can happen. I invite everybody to our September 30th National Citizen Leadership Conference where we have already confirmed speakers from all of those groups coming to speak from members of Congress who are supporting the amendment from Doris Kearns Goodwin is on our advisory committee, her son Joe a veteran of Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan wars um, is going to be test, uh, speaking about the, the connection of public service and equal citizenship to this 28th Amendment drive. It's going to be a wonderful conference to actually have a place where we work together even stronger. So it's a very good question, and the short answer is yes, and we're going to get even stronger and more unified in our work together. So thanks, Mark. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Jerry O'Neill. I was sitting in the house in. in the, the session after the I-166 passed, I was on the House Judiciary Committee, and I helped to kill the bill to pass Citizens United as a constitutional amendment. And I had some questions, and maybe you can answer my questions, so if I ever get the position again, I'll vote a different way. But one of the questions is, I've got this move to amend We the People Amendment, and these questions are pertinent to this as it drafted in uh, House Joint Resolution 48. I don't know, maybe you've got a different amendment coming up now that you're proposing. But I presume this is probably similar to what you're going to have. But if Citizens, Un if, if Citizens United, if the We the People, if, if this becomes an amendment to the Constitution, will that make it reinstate McCain-Feingold or Campaign Practices Act and make it so people can, are more difficult to speak with in 30 days of a primary election and 30, 60 days of a general election. That seems to me it's against free speech. That basically seems to me it's kind of repealing part of the First Amendment or making the First Amendment putting some holes in it. Okay, is that your question? Is That's a big one line behind you. I want to get all your questions and I'll answer okay, them. Okay, okay. Another question. 
will the NRA be allowed to send out their bright red postcards endorsing pro-gun candidates because they're a corporation and that's what the, their members support them to do. Another question, will tax-exempt churches be allowed to raise money from the congregation to send the parishioners to the state capitol to lobby Congress to fight abortions? Because they, okay, maybe not tax-exempt churches, how about churches that are 501c3 so they have a state, life, state permission to, to be tax-free? Now, that's their corporation, I presume. A corporation is a group of people. Got, I've together. got answers if you want. You okay. know, I, I'm ready. Okay. Let's, let's end with that. Oh, there. Okay, I know there's, there's a lot of people behind you. Okay, there, there's some of them. I've got some other okay, questions. Thank you. So there, I appreciate the, um, the questions and the opportunity to, to discuss them because I think it's, that's exactly what the kind of constitutional conversation should be, is what are the implications of doing this? Um, and I think the starting point is, you know, what are the implications of not doing this? Um, we, we know those. It's this Citizens United world of, of uh, dark money, unequal citizenship, loss of our responsibilities as citizens, checking out, corruption, and so on. Um, the constitutional amendment actually itself won't answer those questions. What the constitutional amendment will do is give us, we the people, the ability to answer those questions as we think right. So right now, we don't have the ability to answer those questions that way. The answer is unlimited money, yes. Corporate spending, yes. You'd have a different view, too bad. Your view doesn't count. So we change that. We say in our constitution, we're equal citizens. We have the right to debate and decide for ourselves what the right answers are about money and politics and so on. So we, the McCain-Feingold law or IRS code 501c3, which governs tax exempt groups, or all of the sort of, um, you know, as, as, um, uh, as we heard, those are statutory laws. They come and go, they change, they start like good ideas and end up being, you know, problems. So that, those, that will always go on. We'll always have to adjust. Um, the, what the amendment does is say the people doing the adjustment should be the American people not five justices on the Supreme Court who say there can't be any adjustment, it's this way and the only way. So um, bottom line is we will have work to do. When we get that amendment one, there'll be good debates about should the NRA be spending money? Maybe it depends on what kind of money. Sending leaflets? May, I think many people might think that's just fine. Doing independent expenditure, dark money campaigns with millions of dollars to punish someone who voted the wrong way? Maybe we want to say that might overwhelm the rights of people in that state to be heard as well. Those are balances. The First Amendment is always about balance, right? The First Amendment, I should stop talking to give these poor people a chance to ask a question. It's about balance. So um, that balancing needs adjustment because the Supreme Court has totally put it out of whack and we're not able to get a balance that actually supports democracy anymore. It's as if the Constitution was written to destroy democracy, and we know that's not true. So we're going to restore the balance, and then we will have very good debates on all those questions, um, and we'll have answers, and some of them will be good answers, some of them will be bad answers, and we'll have to adjust. And the Supreme Court doesn't disappear. You know, the 14th Amendment's passed. It's not like, oh, the Supreme Court is out of business. There's lots of equal protection cases that have to be decided by the court. There will still be hard constitutional questions decided by the court. Um, but they will have the guidance of the American people to say we are equal citizens, corporations are not human beings. Use that as your guidance and we will be in a much, much better place. So thanks for your questions. The uh, first one's a suggestion that maybe at the convention, uh, when you have a room full of like-minded individuals, uh, that we could create some sort of action plans. Hopefully that's part of the convention. Yeah, it is thing. Is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then the other, I'm just curious, has anybody ever thought about, or I think from your last answer, I already know, but uh, the idea of just going completely for public financing. Yeah. And evening the playing field. And let the wealthy people, if they really care, dump the money into that system and it gets distributed equally. Okay. Um, has, has that ever? been considered as the way to go. So I want to be fair and do the same thing and take all the questions. Okay. So first question, um, suggestion, thank you, great one. 
We're actually going to have at the conference, if anyone's ever done World Cafe, we're going to have you know, th over 300 people broken up into groups of four or five around tables with smaller conversations so that we can actually get action plans that then scale up. So we really want to do that. Thank you. Second point, at the convention will be a fellow named Jim Pilaro, who's a, in Arizona, where that case happened. He has an amendment. It's actually been introduced, I believe. I can't remember the um, representative who's introduced it in Congress. It doesn't have as much support as the other one yet. But it mandates public funding and makes private funding unconstitutional, essentially. All elections would be publicly funded. Um, that's you know, a long row to go. It's much further than um, to try to say what the policy should be. And so that means it's got a harder road to go to convince two-thirds of the people. But that is in the debate, for sure. Um, and so, yeah, there's ideas about that, of actually requiring public funding as part of this amendment. Um, there are those, of course, who say um, there's too many different views about how it would work in different parts of the country differently, and maybe that should be done as a matter of law after the amendment. Uh, but that, that's a good question, and, and it is, that's the answer. There's, there's actually an amendment. If you leave me your information, I'll email you the text and connect you to Jim Pilaro if you want. Let me take one, just one quick second. Yeah. On public financing, uh, uh, I've got a column on the way because Montana had a successful experiment in public financing in the mid-1970s. Most people don't know that. And it gradually frittered away. So keep an eye out for a column on that because we had some, but we kind of let it slide away from us. My name's Alexandra Volkertz. I'm also an attorney. But I'd like to say that um, I think it would be very helpful if you could explain the impact of initiatives. State initiatives have a, a limited impact on state legislatures. And I'd like you to talk about the impact they have on state legislatures and on federal um, representatives and senators. The other thing I would hope you could clarify is you've mentioned that two states currently have initiatives in the works of her ballots in November. And I'm wondering what other states, how many other states are also considering that? Thank you. So um, first question on the, um, I'm sorry, the first question. Uh, so remind me, say it. Citizens' initiatives. Thank you. Yeah, well, what effect does the resolution have on the, on the states? Thank you. And on Congress. These resolutions are, are non-binding. Um, Montana was stronger than, than most. You didn't urge. You didn't request. You instructed your congressional delegation. But nevertheless, in, in our system, a representative votes their own conscience. And the, res the answer is, if you instruct and you don't like what happens, you, that you take it up with the representative at the ballot box or otherwise. So these aren't binding, um, but they have a tremendous effect. And the effect is many-fold. It's a huge educational opportunity um, to educate others who don't know about it when it's on the ballot and you begin talking about it and communicating about it. It does influence people. As Senator Tester says in his letter, he, he got the message and introduced an amendment in response to it. Direct effect. We have gone from zero to 17 states passing resolutions, we've gone from zero to 54 senators, from zero to 150 congresspeople. That doesn't just happen. These resolutions, although non-binding, actually express the will of the people, which is still hard to ignore despite all the money. And so it can have a very good effect. Uh, but the, you're right to the, raise the question because one of the things we have to look at is what happens after. So it's been a few years since the Montana resolution. We're still not there with the amendment. What can we do to sort of make it stick a little bit? So that's, that's important follow-up that needs to happen. Um, sorry, the second one, Alexandra. Other states, yeah. So I, it's hard to know because they move along at different paces. Um, I don't know if any have a ballot initiative teed up. I know work in Arkansas is going on. Work in Florida is going on. Um, I hope we'll see North Carolina, uh, where Walter Jones has been very active in supporting an amendment in Congress. I think that's potentially. Um, so you know, we'll we'll continue to see states come on board. Missouri is pretty active. We have an American Promise Association in Kansas City, Missouri, doing this work. So I think we'll see more and more states in the next couple of years. So. 
Lynn Exe, Concerned Citizen. Uh, thank you for distilling how uh, Citizens United has corrupted us <laughs> and uh, for the process by which we can uh, be involved. Uh, my question is whether or not American Promise uh, publicizes the uh, legislators and the representatives and the senators statewide and nationally who support overturning Citizens United. Is that publicized anywhere that we can know uh, at any point in time who's in support of an amendment? Yes. So the place to go is unitedforthepeople.org. United with the number four, thepeople.org. So okay. American Promise isn't du duplicating what's already there. That's a very good site, but lots of groups have supported that, and it's maintained. Not only does it have every state and congressional representative who has voted for an amendment, it has all 700 of these resolutions when they happened. It has the state resolutions. It's a very good resource to see where the lay of the land is. United, number four, thepeople.org. Okay, thank you for that. And in the spirit of Montana activism, which has been so effective, um, why wouldn't we not vote for the people who don't support an amendment in the upcoming election? <laughs> I leave that to the good people of Montana. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. My name is Derek Skees. I'm a candidate for House District 11 in the Flathead. I have a question for you, sir. I haven't read the exact language of this, of this amendment. So my concern is this. If, if unfettered access and unlimited money is the sin, then why does this just deal with corporations doing it? Why doesn't it also deal with 501c4s, 501c6s, which are trade associations, the unions? If this fixes the unfettered access of just corporations, won't those entities still have unfettered access? That would be a problem, but we've solved that problem because it doesn't do that. It actually applies to everything, every, any entity, union, billionaire, corporation. So the, the amendment language I read, section one, you may be thinking there is one, people's rights amendment, which just refers to corporations because there was already one that did just the money. And so other amendments kind of bring them together. It's part of the congressional process of different amendments and then they get matched up. But bottom line is the amendment we need, the amendment we support, the amendment that was voted on with 54 senators in, in the Senate says that the states and Congress, we the people, can limit and regulate the money in our elections no matter where the source is coming from. Beautiful. Where can I find that amendment, please? Uh, Democracy for All Amendment. Uh, I'll email it to you. Thank it's, you. Um, it's, uh, um, if you go to that website I mentioned, unitedforthepeople.org, check on constitutional amendments. There's a list of the different versions. The top one is actually the one I'm referring to. Cool. There. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vicki Watson. I just have two questions. Uh, you did give us a website that said who has already come out in support of uh, this amendment. And I think you said that Representative Zinke had not said one way or another yet. I wondered if his opponent, Denise Juno, has said one way or the another. I, I mean, does that website say people who are running for Congress, what position they're taking no, on it? No, it doesn't it have that information. It doesn't have that. So it would just be a matter of asking. It's difficult to track. I think, <laughs> I think you folks should ask those questions. Right, ask, ask them directly. And then my other question is, do you know if there's any plan for the platform committees of any of the um, political parties to put something in their platform about this amendment? Yeah, it, it is in the Democratic Party platform. Um, I don't know, but I don't think it's in the Republican Party platform, but I don't know where that process is right now. Um, but maybe somebody here does. I don't know. In the spirit of Montana activism, I'm hoping the Republicans here will push for that being in their platform as well. Good idea. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, this is just for my information, but can you tell me of the five justices that decided this, how many of them started off as corporate lawyers? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, there's, there's no question that the Supreme Court currently reflects a different kind of balance than in our history. We generally had a different mix, including people experienced with politics. I mean, Samuel Alito, in the majority, replaced Sandra Day O'Connor. She was an Arizona conservative, but she'd run for office. She knew about money in politics, and she was actually in the majority in a case that was overturned by Citizens United. So that difference in justice actually made a difference 
in the Supreme Court, and it's a difference of life experience, actually. The, and if you don't have the life experience um, to give you at least one of nine different perspectives, you end up sometimes, I think, going off the cliff, as they did in Citizens United. Chief Justice Roberts is a very prominent corporate lawyer and gifted appellate advocate, um, but it doesn't necessarily have the same broad experience that either uh, Sandra Day O'Connor or the previous chief who he replaced, um, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Now again, Rehnquist was known as a conservative, but he had experience in government and he had experience in private practice in Arizona. Um, he was the most vocal opponent of creating corporate speech rights on the court. Dissent after dissent from, chief, from Justice Rehnquist, he wasn't chief at the time, Justice Rehnquist saying, this is going to lead to really bad things. I'm paraphrasing, it was a legal argument that was much better than that, but he was warning, basically, it's gonna end in Citizens United if you go down this road, he dissented. So, so it, um, and Chief Justice Roberts replaced him, Samuel Alito replaced Sandra Day O'Connor. So this is not a conservative liberal thing on the court, those were two conservatives who went off the court and replaced by a more corporate-oriented focus. And whether it's that corporate focus or just the lack of life experience that the previous justices had, I think it made them somewhat dogmatic and sort of, you know, analytically pure but completely unrelated to the real world. So um, it's an excellent question. Thank you. This will be the last one. Thank you for staying again. I apologize for running late. I know this was kind of more of a rally of the troops, so to speak, but it would have been, been, been nice to have a dissenting voice speaking just for balance, since we're all about balance. And uh, I, I don't, I think the worst decision in the last hundred years is Roe versus Wade. So I can see why there's a cultural divide here in this country just on this issue, because you guys think that this is the worst decision. We think Roe versus Wade is. And so we're poles apart. And money is not a corrupting influence. It's the love of money that is. And there's a big difference in that phraseology. And it, the question I have for you is, how can you do something like this without ever infringing on a First Amendment right or free speech? You're basically saying that money is not free speech then, right? No. No, okay. but let me, let me, let me okay. address that. Thank you for your, um, your point, and, um, and I respect it. And I have um, expressed no opinion, and nor do I intend to, I promise you, about Roe versus Wade, which is a deeply divisive issue and um, a deeply complicated issue. Um, and, and, I, and I respectfully say um, your views on Roe versus Wade do not in any way make us poles apart. We may have a difference of view, I don't know. I would still hope to persuade you about Citizens United, but there's no cultural divide on Citizens United as far as I know, there may be differences of views about what the First Amendment means, but it's not a cultural divide as, as, as um, the many conservatives who ag are, agree with the need for an amendment. Um, Barry Goldwater was a strong advocate of campaign finance reform and famously said corporations and unions have no place in politics. Um, that wasn't a First Amendment violation, that was traditional American First Amendment law that the speech of human beings and especially in the political space of a democracy, is not, it's not like a marketplace where money can buy you more. That's all we appreciate, that's fine in the marketplace. We don't think it's wrong for someone with more money to be able to buy more. Most Americans actually do think it's wrong for somebody with more money to buy more representation or more power at voting day. Now, not everyone has to agree with that, but that's, that is the viewpoint that it's not a First Amendment violation. In fact, it's probably a First Amendment violation of all the other people who don't have money, whose speech rights are now lost because they can't be heard, they can't spend that kind of money. So I'd urge um, all of us um, to listen to each other. I do listen to you. I sincerely respect what you're saying. I really do. Um, the love of money is very real. You know, greed and it's, and and hunger for money is a real problem. I, I agree with that. Um, I think we can have conversation though about Citizens United and the role of money in our elections, um, even if we don't share the same views on all other things. So um, again, I respect your view. I thank you for raising it. 
and I hope the conversation will continue here in Montana and all over the country, and I'm confident we'll solve this problem together. Thanks.